There are so many questions you're faced with every day, and we're all searching for answers in our lives, personal answers that can help build us in our faith. It's hard to imagine that the answers might be right in front of us. Get ready for God's Word to speak to you through the Bible, and find answers with Bayless Conley. It has been said that failing to make preparations is equivalent to making preparations for failure. There's a lot of truth to that. There are certain things that we must prepare for. And I have a question for you. Are there certain things that God requires us, desires us to prepare? The answer to that, yes. There are certain things that the scriptures specifically teach us that we should make preparations concerning those things. They are very important. If you want to find out what they are, just stay tuned. I would like you to find, if you would, 1 Samuel chapter 7. We'll be reading from that in just a little while. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but our God is a God of preparation. He's a God who prepares things. In the book of Jonah, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, that great Assyrian capital, and preach to them, and Jonah didn't want to do it. He had a bit of a nationalistic spirit. The Assyrians were the sworn enemies of Israel, maybe being a prophet, he knew that ultimately Assyria would be, would be the undoing of Israel. So he gets on a boat to go to Tarshish, modern-day Spain, as far away as you can get from Nineveh in that day. And, you know, the storm comes on the sea, and, and all the, the guys cry out to their gods, and Jonah says, look, here's the problem. I serve the God that made, you know, the dry land and the sea, and, and I'm disobeying him. If you want the st storm to stop, throw me in. So they do. And the Bible says, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Now, Jonah did not know the Lord had prepared him a, a fish to swallow him. Jonah was trying to commit suicide. Jonah would have rather drowned than obeyed God. He really hated the Assyrians. And so it was an act of God's mercy, the preparation of that fish that swallowed Jonah. It spits him up on the shore several days later. And uh, I'm sure there was some Assyrians fishing down there and the, their main god was called Dagon, which was half fish and half man. So when a, spit, a fish spits a guy up on the shore, I'm sure it got their attention. Well, he goes into Nineveh and preaches and Jonah is so dismayed because they actually repented. He didn't want that to happen. He wanted them to be destroyed. Hey, you know, there's some Christians that just hope some people will go to hell. <laughs> That's a wrong attitude to take. Read the book of Jonah. So Jonah sits on a hill, sort of crosses his arms, hoping that God will change his mind and kill them all. And the Bible says the Lord prepared a plant, and it suddenly grew up over Jonah and gave him shade. But then it says the Lord prepared a worm that ate the root of the plant, and it withered. And then the Lord prepared an east wind. And Jonah became so uncomfortable, he wished he could die. And all of that led to a lesson God was teaching him on the value of people. But the fact is, God prepared a fish, God prepared a plant, God prepared a worm, and God prepared an east wind. In Exodus chapter 23, when God talks about bringing Israel to the promised land, it says that I'm going to bring you to the place that I have prepared for you. God got it ready ahead of time. It indicates much thought, timing, and work involved. Hebrews 11.6, he has prepared a city for us. 1 Corinthians 2.9, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. God is a God of preparation. And you know, Ephesians 5, 1 says, as children, we should be imitators of God. Now, among other things, 
we need to reflect this attribute of preparation. We need to imbibe this, this characteristic that God has being people that prepare. And I want to share with you three ways the scriptures indicate that we should be people of preparation. Number one, we need to prepare our hearts. Now, as we open up with a story here in 1 Samuel 7, Israel has been under the heel of the Philistines for some time. The Philistines have captured a number of Israelite cities and they are oppressing them severely. And even the Ark of the Covenant has been captured by the Philistines. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was that box that Moses had made. It was overlaid with gold. The, the top part of it was called the mercy seat. If you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know what it looks like. And inside there was a, a, a pot that had manna in it, Aaron's rod that budded, and a copy of the Ten Commandments. Above it there was these two angels made of beaten gold, and under the Old Covenant the presence of God rested there above the mercy seat, that the tangible manifest presence of God was there above the Ark of the Covenant. And the Philistines have captured it due to Israel's disobedience and carelessness. Now, God is certainly well able to take care of himself. And it finally got to the point, the, the Philistines were so plagued, they said, we got to get rid of this thing or God's going to destroy us all. So it ends up back in the hands of Israel once again and eventually lands in the city of Kirjath, Jerem. And that's where we pick it up in verse 2, 1 Samuel chapter 7. It says, so it was that the ark remained in Kirjath Jerem for a long time. It was there 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And the idea is that Israel didn't begin to lament or repent and turn toward God until 20 years had passed. The Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, puts that verse this way. After 20 years, the whole house of Israel looked up again to the Lord. The Message Bible says a long time passed, 20 years it was, and throughout Israel, there was widespread fearful movement toward God. Almost 20 years without any regard for the Ark of the Covenant. Almost 20 years without regard for the presence of God. And suddenly, there's a widespread, fearful movement toward God. Suddenly, after two decades, people in mass begin to look up to God once again. And Samuel, who was a judge in Israel, took advantage of that moment, and he spoke. Look with me in verse 3, if you would. It says, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, if you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only. And those were male and female idols that the people had begun to worship. And God did indeed help them defeat the Philistines and recapture the cities that they had lost. But I want you to think about it. 20 years of oppression by the enemy. 20 years with very little freedom. 20 years with very little blessing and almost no favor. 20 years with no presence of God. And the priests carried on with their ceremonies every day and the people with their lives. And then suddenly, God begins to touch hearts. This thing after 20 years when there was this widespread movement toward God and looking up to God, God had done it by his spirit. And I have the sense that we are in a similar time right now. I have a sense that there is a, a, a movement, that God's spirit is doing something all around us and perhaps even globally right now. And we need to seize the opportunity, even as Samuel did, 
and he gave the people instructions. So God begins to touch their hearts, and Samuel says, put away your idols and prepare your hearts for the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Prepare your hearts for the Lord. And we can over-spiritualize it, and I think we make a mistake doing so. Here, the foremost thing in preparing their hearts was removing idols. He said, put away your idols and prepare your heart. An idol is anything that comes before God in your life. 1 John 5, 21, in the New Testament, John writes, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Don't let anything take the place of God in your heart. It could be a boyfriend. It could be a girlfriend. It could be money. It could be a career, a sport, a hobby, yourself. Any of those things can be an idol. One of the Ten Commandments, God said, you'll have no other gods before me. I'm first. I, I don't want to be flavor of the month. I was listening to an interview of a pro golfer, and it's somebody that I very much admired his game and the way that he played. And the interviewer, interestingly enough, asked some very personal questions. And the golfer said, well, to be honest, because of my dedication to the game, it's cost me my marriage. I lost my wife. And I've lost all my children. They're all grown now, and to this day, I am not close with any of my grown children. And the interview look, interviewer looked at him and said, well, if you had the chance, would you do anything differently? And without hesitation, he said, no, golf is my God. Yeah. Well, I, for one, am not content to carry on with no blessing, no favor, and little liberty. We need God's presence, and it will come in a greater measure as we prepare our hearts for him. And then also, preparing our hearts for God means to seek his word, because God and his word are what? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And a great example is Ezra greatly used by God, had favor and influence, saw the Holy Spirit working in his life. It's the very next book in your Bible. Look there with me in Ezra chapter 7. Ezra 7 and verse 9. Ezra 7 and 9. It says, on the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Now, God's good hand was upon him for he had prepared his heart to do three things. To, number one, to learn the word of God. Number two, to do the word of God. And number three, to teach the word to others. To learn the word, to do the word, and to teach the word. Can we say those three things? Learn the word, do the word, and teach the word. Teach it to someone else. If your heart will embrace that, you will find yourself in pretty good shape spiritually. The hand of God was on Ezra. He had prepared his heart to seek scriptures, to do scriptures, and to teach them to someone else. I came to service. It was actually right before the accident happened. A guy tossed me a baseball, and uh, my name was written on it. He said, look, I come to church. You pitch the word of God, and I catch it with my heart. Get up there and start pitching. I'm ready. Uh, see, that's a heart prepared. That was a very, I, I thought, a brilliant way to outwardly express the inward posture and intent of his heart. Now, I, I've come, my heart's prepared to deliver this word. And when a heart prepared to deliver the, the word meets a heart that's prepared to receive it, amazing things can happen. Let's not be casual you know, in our study of the Bible, and when we come together to hear the word of God preached, 
that there's a million things that could distract each and every one of us, but let's determine to close ourselves in with God and have some aha moments in the Word, to learn it, to do it, and to teach it to someone else. All right, secondly, we need to prepare our guest rooms. Keep your your finger here. We'll come back to the general vicinity. And look in the New Testament of the book of Philemon. It's right before the book of Hebrews. Philemon was a convert of the Apostle Paul. He was a wealthy man. There was a church in his home. And when Paul writes the letter, he's writing while in chains. He is a Roman prisoner. And look what he says in verse 22. There's just one chapter in this short book. He said, but meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. That is great faith in the God who answers prayer. Paul is a Roman prisoner wearing chains. He refers to it earlier in the letter, but he says, prepare a guest room for me. I believe God's going to answer your prayers and he's going to send me back to you. Rome thinks they're in charge. They are not in charge. The Lord Jesus Christ is in charge. In fact, yeah. In the same book, he doesn't refer to himself as a prisoner of Rome. He calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, faith always requires action. What is your guest room? All right, thirdly, we need to prepare our giving. I want you to follow me if you would. Look back in the Old Testament once again. First Chronicles chapter 29. Here we have the story of David building the house of God. First Chronicles 29 and verse 1. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might. And he goes on, he mentions the gold, the silver, and and all the materials that he had prepared. David said, I have prepared with all of my might. Now David made preparation. He made preparation with all of his heart. He prepared abundantly, and he took much trouble in preparing. David was in to preparation, and he did it with generational thinking. It was for Solomon. It was for his grandchildren and the kids to come. It wasn't just something that he could enjoy. He prepared building plans. He prepared finances. He prepared materials, work crews, teams to manage things. He thought about it, he prayed about it, and he prepared in advance. Did you know that's what the New Testament teaches us to do as well when it comes to our giving? Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The subject here is an offering that the Corinthians were going to give. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 2. Paul writes to them about this offering, and he said, For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting." Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Think about the language. You said that you'd be ready, that it be prepared beforehand, promised ahead of time speaks of of, of prayer and thought and getting things ready before. Verse 6, this is a promise that applies, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, 
He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The fact is, whatever you give into God's kingdom, God will multiply it back to you. He doesn't settle up the first and the 15th of every month, but God always settles up. He is no man's debtor. And this promise is as applicable and as true today as it was then. It is there to be believed and embraced by anyone that gladly gives. Verse 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. He said, let every person give as a purpose in their heart. Speaks of forethought. Speaks of, of preparedness and prayer. In fact, this is brilliant. Listen to this from the Message Bible. It's just classic. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. You see, preparing or giving in advance protects us from being manipulated or pressured. And unfortunately, a fair bit of that goes on in God's church. I wanted to mention one more scripture to you as I close. It's Ephesians 6 and 15. It says, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the idea is we must be prepared to carry the gospel to anyone God sends us to at any time. We need to be prepared. And that gospel, when it comes, it first brings peace with God, and then it brings the peace of God. One of the main words used for peace in the New Testament means to reunite something that's been cut apart or severed. And sin has severed us from a relationship with God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus, through his death on the cross, paid the price for those sins and has made the way for us to have peace with God, to be reunited in relationship with him. It's what the human heart longs for. You will not find it in a new relationship with another person. You won't find it in a new drug or a new drink. You won't find it in climbing the corporate ladder. You will not find it in what the world calls success. You will not find it in, in doing good works. It's only found through a relationship with God by embracing his son, Jesus Christ. Now, as we go today, may our feet be shod with the preparation. Just on our hearts say, God, anyone, anywhere, as much as I might stumble and feel awkward, I'm just gonna do it. Even if it's, just, if it's a simple, hey, just wanna tell you, Jesus loves you. And right now, I just wanna carry that gospel message to you, good news. God's not angry with you, he loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. It is not about, you know, miles and miles of, of a list of things that you're no longer allowed to do. It's not about, you know, adhering to some ceremony or mindless ritual. It's about knowing God. It's what your heart has cried out for always. He's just a prayer away. Would you close your eyes for a moment if you would? If you want peace with God and then you want to experience the peace of God, pray with me. Tie your heart around the words. If you're a backslider, it's time to come home. Yeah, you may have to make a few hard decisions after you make this first decision to come back to him, but he'll help you in those decisions. You should pray out loud after me. Say, oh God, from the bottom of my heart, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. And I believe that through his death, he paid for the sin of the world. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. I believe you were raised from the dead. And I ask you to come into my life as my Lord and Savior. From this moment forward, I follow you. I'm all in. Amen.
I'm so glad that you've taken the time to listen to this. And, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for those of you that have prayed for us. And I just want to encourage everybody that's listening. If you haven't ever prayed for us, please do. I personally am very aware, the whole team here is very aware that we would not be able to do the things we're doing if not for the grace of God and for the prayers of the saints. And this is a big favor I'm asking, I know. But if you would just tuck a little time in there, maybe even daily, you know, to pray for us and for the work that God is doing through us, that, that, that His grace would strengthen us and sustain us, that God would open doors of favor for us, that, that we can walk through and, and preach the word to previously unreached people, that we can lift up broken and hurting people. And God can open doors that no man can shut, but it seems that He only does the things He does in conjunction with willing hearts and praying people. And uh, pray as well that, that sufficient finances would come in to meet all of our obligations, as well as to go into new regions, you know, to take the gospel there. And certainly the gospel is free, but the pipeline to get it there, as one person so aptly said, is very expensive. And so, so pray for the, the material needs to be met, as well as for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And if you would do that, I would be so grateful. In fact, thank you in advance from my heart and from the, the hearts of all on our team. Thank you for being a part of what we're doing. We'll see you next time. God bless you. I am so excited. I'm going to be coming again to a number of cities throughout Germany and Switzerland, two of my favorite nations. I'm going to be preaching the Word of God, and I really want to encourage you to find out where the meetings are. Come out if you can. I would love to meet you personally, and we just trust the blessing of God is going to be on our time together in Germany and Switzerland. If you want to go on a journey, you need to pack a suitcase. If you want to cook a meal, you need to have ingredients. And if you want to experience an outpouring of answered prayers and blessings from God, there are things you will need to do in advance. Vela shares three ways you can prepare for God in a message called Three Things Every Believer Should Prepare. Are you ready for all the good things God wants to do for you? Order this teaching on CD or DVD. Call us or visit us online at bayless-conley.de.